Good morning, everyone. Imagine this. Imagine that you work for an IT company and you have developed this AI solution that you're using to automate processes for your customers. So you use your solution to automate some back office processes for some of the largest banking companies you work for. And after you deploy your solution, you get this call from your customer. And the call goes like this. You know, the solution that you have deployed is so good. Actually, it's making our processes much more efficient than before. Actually, it's so good that I have now a problem. Because based on the efficiency that I'm getting, maybe I need to fire 90% of my team. So basically, the question was, can you make your solution work worse? I think it was the first and the last time a customer has asked me if I can make a solution work worse. This is not an hypothetical call. This is a call I received some years ago after we developed a system like the one I'm describing. I'm David Pereira. I'm the global head of data and AI at Sador. And today I'm here to share with you the three rules of responsible AI. My talk will be about what, what, what we can do as, as leaders in our companies to make the future of AI more responsible. Because there are a lot of discussion going on about what frontier AI labs should be doing or not doing. But maybe we are not talking that much about what regular companies should be doing when buying AI, when they are integrating an AI, AI into their processes. So my talk will be based in these three rules. These three rules come from the Humane Center for Technology. Uh, Asher Raskin and Tristan Harris are the authors behind these three rules. And I'm going to be speaking today about how these three rules will impact the decisions that you make in your corporate environment when you are adopting AI. So basically, let me start with the rule number one. So rule number one says that when we discover a new technology, we are also discovering a new set of responsibilities. So think about this. We didn't, we didn't need the right to be forgotten before the internet came in. We didn't need privacy rights before everyone was taking a camera in their pockets. With AI, we are discovering a lot of new uses with this kind of technology. But the question is, are we taking the same time to think about the new responsibilities? So basically, when I'm consulting with my customers, I tell them that they should be asking four questions. First question is, what are your deadlines? What are the use cases that you are not thinking about deploying no matter what? Because they are so risky, because they are not responsible, because they are not ethical. That's question number one. Question number two is, what kind of human vulnerabilities are we exposing with the solution that we are creating, with the solution that we are deploying? Third question. What are the, 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 are we able to explain the decisions that AI is making for us? If we are not able to do so, don't deploy that solution. And last but not least, are we ready if everything goes wrong at scale? Do we have a plan for that? Those are the four questions that everyone should be asking at a corporate level before we are buying, before we are integrating an AI solution. If you think about that, we don't want to become the scientists in Jurassic Park. We are spending a lot of time thinking about what's possible, because we have a lot of scientists thinking about, oh, cool, we can use AI for this kind of use case. But the question is, should we? Should we be doing that kind of use case in our companies? So those questions are the ones that I'm asking to not become the scientists in Jurassic Park. Let's move to rule number two. Rule number two says that if a right technology is conferring power, it will start a race. It will start a race because companies will start competing to get that power that technology is conferring. So let me put you an example. I'm sure that you have all heard now about Sora2, the new video model from OpenAI. And I think that this is not just a model. It's, it's a signal of this kind of race, right? Because Technology is amazing, right? But should we be deploying this into production? Because 
how is this affecting what's real or not? How is this affecting online trust? Can we trust what we are seeing on the internet? But this is not the only use case. At a corporate level, every single company right now is thinking about how they can deploy autonomous agents. So we have a lot of fancy new technologies such as MCP, agent-to-agent -agent protocols. Even we have protocols for creating autonomous economies between agents collaborating uh, against each other. The question is, have we stopped thinking about what the future of our society looks like if we are automating how we buy and sell things? What's the role for us in the economy? So that's what I'm talking when I'm talking about races. We are rushing to get the power of AI technology, but maybe we are not thinking about the long-term consequences. And I'm seeing three particular races uh, when using AI in companies. The first race is the race for efficiency. So every single company is trying to get efficiency from AI in the short term. At what price? A lot of times, these kind of companies are not thinking about the side effects of these efficiency use cases can create. So the thing is that in our observations, what we are seeing is that companies are getting 15% efficiency in their processes by using AI. But at the same time, one third of these companies are facing unanticipated side effects from deploying these kind of AI use cases. Second race. The second race is the data race. You know that, right? In order to get a better AI, you need more data to train your models. The thing is that in order to do that, we are not paying attention at <clears throat> things such as IP, copyright, data privacy. And not only that, a lot of companies are becoming what I call data vacuum cleaners. Actually, they are getting more data that they are able to manage responsibly. Actually, four times more data that we can manage responsibly. So this is the second race we are seeing. The third race is the race for talent. What we are seeing is that there's a very high scarcity of, uh, of talent around AI ethics. And this is leading us to a strategy that I call AI first, ethics later. And this doesn't make sense because, again, we should be thinking about not what we can do. We should be thinking about what we should be doing. IBM says that only 5% of the total AI investment is, is going into AI ethics. And the reality that we are seeing is that for every 15 engineers working on AI, we only have one ethics specialist working on this. So this, this is the actual ratio of specialists working on the field right now. The thing about these races is that companies can use it for their own advantage. This is what I call the ethical competitive advantage. And what I, whenever I do consultancies with my customers, I tell them that they should use three strategies around this. The first one is what I called transparency as a differentiator. The thing is that you should be the company that is always explaining if you are using AI or not in your solution. Not only that, you, you should also be explaining how you're using AI. What kind of decisions is AI helping you to make? And you should do this beforehand. Because if you only do that when things goes wrong, you're losing trust. This is the first one. Then the second strategy is actually trust as an asset. So think, for example, IBM. One decision that IBM made some time ago is that they are not going to sell image recognition technology for mass surveillance. So this is a decision that is costing them money because they are not selling this kind of technology. But at the same time, they are getting recognition for being a trustable company in AI. This is the second strategy. <clears throat> and the third strategy is what I call sustainability as a strategy. Let's think about the long-term incentives that you can get with AI and not the short-term efficiencies that are getting those unanticipated effects that we were seeing before. So these are all some other examples uh, about this kind of, of, of rules. But basically, you should build transparency, trust, sustainability. And then this leads us to rule number three. Rule number three says that when you start the race, when you start the race to get the power that comes from technology, and in particular from AI, you need coordination. 
because if you're not coordinating that race, that will end in tragedy. That will end in tragedy for your company, that might end in tragedy for the whole society. In my experience, <coughs> there is a huge difference in results between companies that are not creating coordination efforts uh, compared with the companies that do have this kind of coordination efforts. So you need two different levels of coordination. The first one is what I call the internal coordination. Again, you cannot have only technical people thinking about AI. You need your chief AI officer working together with your ethical committee, working together with your security teams, working together with your communication teams, thinking all together what's the use cases that you should be deploying in your organization. In terms of the second coordination, this is the external one. Because if you want to really control this race, you should be having discussions with not only regulators, but also with civil society. You should also be having conversations with your competitors, and you should be having conversations with everyone involved in AI. Because whenever you're talking with them, you might think on the long-term incentives that are beyond AI, and you can control the race. So yes, I think there is, we are now in the time that, that we need to raise, but we need to raise in the right track. We need to raise in the right direction. So that is why I created this race framework. And this race framework basically says that we need to create four things in order to coordinate uh, AI in our organizations. So let me put you four examples of companies that are doing things that are related to this framework. So the R in the race framework goes for responsibility mapping. So take, for example, the case of Unilever. So Unilever decided that they wanted to use AI for their recruitment processes. But before doing so, <coughs> what they did was to map every single responsibility that they needed to ensure that this new recruitment was going to be fair. So what they did was, first of all, they assessed the impact of this new recruitment system in two different groups of people. Then they made some proof of concept with synthetic data to make sure that this was not affecting anyone. And not only that, <coughs> they also created an external auditing system to make sure that every single decision was the right one. So that's the R for responsibility mapping in the race framework. The A goes for accountability systems. So this is the case, for example, of Santander. So Santander has implemented two things for their credit risk systems. The first one <coughs> is that they have equity KPIs. This means that whenever they are providing credit to their customers, they have some KPIs that are related to what kind of groups are asking for that kind of credit. And they make sure that there is no difference between those groups. Not only that, they also have some dashboards in order to visualize if they are fulfilling those KPIs or not, if they are being fair with their credit risk systems. So that's the A <coughs> for the RACE framework. Then we have the C for coordination efforts. And that's the case of Johnson & Johnson. If you remember, I was talking about the external coordination. So this is exactly what Johnson & Johnson is doing with the FDA. They are working together to create some standards so they can use those standards in order to create ethical AI for pharma. And last but not least, the E in race goes for ethical innovation. And this is what Patagonia is doing. Patagonia is using AI to track how sustainable are their suppliers. And they are getting their suppliers from the top sustainable ones. So this is the way you actually use AI to do what's right, and not only to get efficiencies in the, in the short term. So finally, let me finish this talk by saying that the question is not if AI is going to transform your company, if it's going to transform society. It will. The question is, what kind of leaders do you want to become? Do you want to become the leaders that are managing AI responsibly in your organizations? Or do you want to become the ones that just stand looking at the results? So the time for this decision is now. And as Asa Raskin and Tristan Harris said, we are now the grown-ups in the room. It's us who should be making those hard decisions. And just remember that it's not a principle until it costs you money. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.